Dr. Daxton it comes from the Mayo Clinic, uh, anesthesiology and perioperative medicine. Um, we're lucky to get the opportunity to listen to your journey and to your um, experience as a physician who was uh, who decided to go ahead and, and volunteer. There. All right. Uh, so, uh, again, my name is Ben Daxon. I'm an anesthesiologist and intensivist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, before I say anything, just wanted to say thank you to Ed Coombs and the team at Draeger for the invitation to speak, for Winnie, for uh, facilitating this despite all the technical glitches. Those are all on my end here, nothing on, uh, on their end, so I take full responsibility for that. So, the need. Um, can you all still see the screen as I'm sl sliding through here? Okay, so the picture on the left is from the best man at my wedding. Um, the weekend before I went, uh, that man is Jonathan Davis. He's an outpatient med peds guy in Georgia. And his wife had shot me an email while I was working in a tele ICU to let me know that he had gone to volunteer in New York. Uh, I was a little shocked because I hadn't heard about him even considering going. Uh, he was not an ICU guy. He was not a critical care guy. He had no ties to New York uh, and he had five kids at home. You can see some of them in that picture. So I immediately gave him a call because I was literally sitting in an ICU where my job was to answer critical care questions for people who were not used to taking care of critical care patients. Perfect, perfect setup. Best friend, uh, here I am ready to help. And I gave him a call and the first question he asked me was, what do I do with Pete? And I thought, oh boy, we're, we're in for a long, hard slot, uh, uh, slog here. So uh, the stories that he told me then were just uh, horrific. Whatever you heard on the news, it was much worse, at least where my friend was. Um, he said his first night, he probably averaged about three codes an hour. So if you imagine a code's 30 minutes, you can't do three in an hour. And he did that every single hour times 12. Um, that hospital where he was normally had five ICU beds. Um, Sunday. April 19th down there, uh, they had over 100 ICU COVID patients. Um, they had over 70 FEMA ventilators brought in. The hospital was just overwhelmed. Um, that day, uh, the first day of my friend being there was the first day that they had a ICU physician in-house. Uh, the hospital did have one, but uh, unfortunately had left um, a month prior and their one other one had actually come down with COVID himself and so they were without a critical care physician trying to manage all this at the same time so i, I had this horrible conversation with my friend I, I was trying to help him out and when i got off the phone with him i went back to my tele icu and at that point uh, we had three COVID patients in our icu and we have you know 200 icu beds at mayo i mean we had nowhere near the uh influx that they did and the nurses were figuring out uh, how they were going to go about with furloughs that had just been announced that day. And so the contrast was pretty stark. And so I went home and uh, spoke to my wife. Uh, first of all, that had to be uh, uh, conversation number one. And we decided that uh, this was something we needed to do. Um, I then spoke to Mayo Clinic and the various administrative people that were involved. Uh, you can imagine this was back when we didn't know what was gonna happen, the sky was falling and there wasn't a lot of uh, excitement uh, about giving up critical care physicians when we could be next. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to have the support of um, those above me. We worked out the logistics. I had uh, a free flight from the United a Hotel, donated a free room for me. Um, so the logistics were taken care of. One of the reasons we felt I was uh, okay to go was my family had been through this before. I was previously on active duty with the U.S. Army, as you can see there in the middle. Uh, we knew what it meant for me to be gone for an extended period. We had um, wills in place, things like that. Uh, so we felt we were in a unique position to be able to go. Um, and then uh, lastly, I'm a Christian. My faith informs a lot of my decisions in life. Uh, the Heidelberg Catechism is part of the core of uh, my beliefs and um, uh, that uh, had a big impact on what ended up uh, moving me to go. Um, so uh, preparing, you can see on the left, that's probably the weirdest packing um, I've ever had for a suitcase. I had my iPad with all of my notes, all of my PPE gear. I had my butterfly pocus. I had my own sandy wipes. Um, um, I don't think I'll ever pack quite like that again. And then the airport there on the right, if you can't see anybody else in the picture besides me, that's because there's not. Um, not a single other person was in the airport except for five other people on my flight. Uh, I've never gone through security so fast. Uh, personal protective equipment always comes up. So I did bring some of my own. You can see there on the left, 
Uh, I'm wearing a scuba mask. So I'm actually in the hospital in New York there. Uh, that is a scuba mask that I have a buddy at Mayo who is in our 3D printing shop, and he 3D printed an adapter so I could put on a viral filter. Um, you can see on the bottom of the mask, that's at the end of the day. It's just condensation. Uh, it was hot. It was suffocating. Unfortunately, I couldn't talk, so I had to just revert to normal N95s for the rest of the week. There in the middle, you can see that was their PPE um, supply tower walking into the unit. It's exhausted. It was a scavenger hunt every time to, to find the equipment. Um, uh, the guy on the far right uh, was just somebody on my flight, and I felt people on the plane randomly had better uh, preparedness for uh, working in an ICU than a lot of us did, but we made the best with what we had. Uh, so this was the unit I went to work in. I ended up not going to the same hospital where my best man was. Uh, as you can see, it's not an ICU. So the hospital where I volunteered only had three ICUs. They made three additional ones. Uh, this area, these two are shut when you're going in or going out. It's just curtains that you pull. Um, I had all these grand plans about how we were going to don and doff appropriately and adhere to strict PPE guidance and we were going to be very strict and uh, there's a famous Prussian general who has a quote again to go back to my military days that no no plan survives first contact with the enemy and that was certainly true for us things were just getting disconnected left and right and uh, no one really seemed to care because in this environment it didn't seem to make a difference you were exposed no matter what you were going to do so when I got there these are some of the problems that I saw um, I'll see if I can get this to play it may not um, which is a shame um, this was a ultrasound that another um, fellow I worked with one night had taken. Uh, this was actually not one of my patients. This is not my hospital. Um, you can kind of see in the middle there, that's the IVC going in the right atrium. And in the very middle, there's kind of a white ball in the right atrium. That is one of about four um, golf ball sized clots in the right atrium that were just jumbling around like ping pong balls. And about 15 seconds after they quit taking this video, the patient abruptly coded, as you can imagine, from a massive pulmonary embolism. So these patients were unbelievable. I'm not sure if you all are saying the same thing at your hospitals, but the anticoagulation conundrum was uh, incredibly frustrating. Um, so that patient right there with all of these massive clots, that patient had developed those already on full dose Lovenox. Um, I did not have a single patient with a dialysis catheter who did not need a dose of Alteplase at least once a day. In fact, it was into the right ventricle just because it has more turbulent blood flow and was less likely to clot off. Um, mostly respiratory therapists here, so you may not appreciate it, but that's nuts. Uh, you don't put things in the right ventricle your holes, but uh, they felt that the risk was worth the benefit. Uh, here's probably what you're more interested in, the ventilator issue. So the hospital I worked in definitely did not have enough ventilator so we got tons of these FEMA LTV uh, 1200s so oh, I think I have the 900 up here but uh, for practical purposes it's the same uh, and sorry your careers I had to use these a bunch when I was deployed in the military those days when I go back a challenge um, the unit where I was uh, things had kind of slowed down in New York City so they had tried to not admit any new patients to my unit and mine were kind of the long-term patients so most everybody there except for two had been innovated for at least a week more likely two or three um, so you can imagine being on an LTV for two weeks with COVID, uh, your lungs are a shredded mess. Uh, I frequently had patients with a PEEP of 20, a driving pressure of 20, and tidal volumes of four milliliters per kilogram, and they had CO2s through the roof. I mean, there was, it, it seemed uh, fruitless no matter what uh, settings we adjusted. With one exception, uh, there were two patients that did actually remarkably well um, on the ventilator. Uh, and to the right is a note of one of the patients. I had a conversation and he wrote, scared, you can see at the top, and after we talked for a little bit, he wrote, the air is good now. And the point I made when I showed this to some of my colleagues is that I, I think we, we overthink a lot of our medical management and just simple humanity goes a long way. Uh, this was a young guy, 39. He was just a few years older than me. And I, I felt a connection with him. He didn't have any medical issues before COVID and he was very scared he was gonna die. And I just sat there for 20 minutes and we just talked as best we could through a tube and notes. And um, at the end of it, he said, there's good now. And he felt fine. And I didn't change his vent. I didn't give any meds. I think it was just the fact he had someone to talk to made a difference. So uh, if you leave my talk with one thing, it's uh, take an extra five minutes just to try and 
be a person for your patients. They don't have family members, I'm assuming, visiting as frequently as they normally would without COVID. The other thing, though, that might interest you is that when he wrote that, the air is good now, uh, he wrote that while he was on APRV. I said I had two patients that did very well, and those two happened to both be on APRV, and, it, uh, and the air is good now. He wrote that on a P high of 34. So uh, just, I'm not going to get into the detail that people would believe me if I told them I had someone writing notes to me on a CPAP of 34 with COVID, but it does happen. One of the other problems is uh, the dead space ventilation in the lungs and VQ mismatching. And so I had one patient who'd been intubated for 18 days and you can see to the far right, his CO2 had climbed to 104. Uh, that was actually down from the day prior when it was 156. We had done everything we could to get it there. Uh, so the 104 is on a minute ventilation of 16 liters a minute with Tylenol and cold packs and everything else we can do to try and decrease the CO2 production. Uh, but this guy started needing more vasopressors, his urine output was dropping, and we could just tell he was starting to circle the drain. And I thought, you know what I would really love to try would just be some nitric oxide. But we were out of nitric oxide. We ran out a long time ago. But um, when uh, scarcity and necessity uh, meet, uh, ingenuity comes. And so we ended up taking um, oh, kind of a bastardized form of nebulization here, hooked up a little device. Uh, I'm sure some of you can see it there. It's kind of in the background blurred out. I'm, uh, forgive me, I don't remember the name of the device, but it nebulizes medications. And we didn't have any nitric oxide. So we, we, took, nitric, uh, we took nitroglycerin sublingual tabs that you would give for acute coronary syndrome, diluted those into, we took three of those tabs, diluted them into three milliliters of normal saline, put that in the little vial, put the cap on, and said, here goes nothing. And you can see up at the top, we took this guy's CO2 without any change to his ventilator or any other new medications from 104 to 60. And we thought, oh my gosh, that actually worked. Uh, we gotta keep doing this, this is amazing. And so uh, we, will, we were able to find some actual uh, IV nitroglycerin. And I went over to the OR and grabbed a bottle of this. Uh, we spiked it and through uh, a dripper you'd adjust manually, we figured out what the rate would be to keep a constant level in that a nebulization chamber, and we made our own nitric oxide infusion for this guy. Um, uh, this is not standard of care. Uh, this is not how medicine normally goes, but um, you know we were doing the best with what we had. And uh, I'll say, I don't know if it ended up making a difference in this patient's care. I left and he was still in the ICU uh, several days later. Uh, but if nothing else, it gave everybody in the unit um, a little bit of hope. Uh, this guy was heading, heading in the wrong place fast. And for a brief moment, uh, we righted the ship um, and we felt like if we could pull that off, maybe we could pull off some other stuff and not everybody was uh, a lost cause. So um, yeah, uh, these are some of the people I worked with. This was uh, a wonderful and frustrating aspect at the same time. No one once complained. Um, almost everybody there uh, was a fellow who uh, <laughs> had no critical care training. The, the picture on the left, I've got a GI fellow and a cardiology fellow. Uh, they never thought they'd step foot in an ICU again, at least to run it like they did when they were interns, but there they were. Uh, the woman to my right is a ER physician who had been there 19 nights in a row. Uh, I don't know how she did it. Um, the group on the far right, that's a uh, day team, night team sign out, um, uh, ragtag group, but uh, I go into battle with any one of them uh, all over again. They were, again, absolutely fantastic. Um, but the the time there took its toll. Uh, that's a picture of me there um, on the left. Um, you can see my nose is a little red. Um, we're in the N95 every day uh, for uh, long shifts. Um, I actually uh, was at lunch with someone the morning after my last shift, went and grabbed uh, breakfast, and I, I took my mask off to eat, and I didn't even know it, but I had all this blood dripping down my nose, and she had to give me her napkin so I could wipe my face just to, just to eat my food. Uh, the picture on the right there, um, uh, you know, I told you some of the stats of the hospital where my friend was. I'm not going to tell you too many of the hospital where I was, again, just for their privacy's sake. But those are note cards from the infectious disease consultant. Um, he counted them up. I want to say he had like 47. Um, you know, every one of those is a 20 to 30 minute review. Uh, and he does that every day, weekends, weekdays. And he'd been doing it for over a month. Uh, and the guy was in his 60s. He was just getting crushed, absolutely crushed. Um, so I don't know how much good I did for the patients, but um, I worked uh, all the night shifts while I was there. And uh, I know I at least gave a lot of those guys a chance to go home and have dinner with their family. And if nothing else, I'm happy just to be able to provide that. Um, 
So processing it all. Uh, this is a little weird for me. I uh, initially would just post things about what happened to me on my Facebook page just to kind of update family and friends. You know, I'm going into the epicenter of all this and people were nervous about my health. And my brief posts became longer and longer and longer. And I found it ended up being very cathartic for me. I would finish my night shift, go grab breakfast, uh, walk home, uh, write my thoughts. And uh, um, I was surprised how helpful it was for a lot of other people. Um, you know, I live in the ICU. It's what I uh, live and breathe. And I think about it all the time. But people outside of the ICU really don't understand what goes on in the ICUs, I'm sure sure you know you all can attest to when you have families come in and you try and have conversations and they just they don't appreciate the gravity or they ask for uh, procedures and you know they just don't realize the futility of what they're they're pursuing um, and so I, I was surprised how helpful it was for people to uh, read what I had gone through and for them to kind of understand what they were seeing on the news uh, and so through friends of friends uh, my Facebook ramblings uh, got picked up and uh, published uh, uh, on a national news website, um, um, and through that, uh, Ed found out about me and gave me a, a, a ring to come and speak here. Um, I don't say all that just to say I got published in the news, look at me. Uh, I say that because I spent a lot of time thinking through uh, those posts, and especially now when I found out that they were going to be uh, uh, put on a national display. I will say it's a little nerve wracking to have uh, your ramblings after a night shift uh, suddenly be projected to you know millions of people and um, uh, you cringe at all the typos and grammar errors. But anyway, the point of the slide is I was shocked for my own benefit, the power of writing it out, of talking about it, of doing things like this. Um, I've given a couple talks to our fellows, and uh, I'm slated to give uh, anesthesia grand rounds next week, and it's been very helpful for me. Um, I have a lot of bad memories from my time there. Um, I think I could have done things differently, and by differently, I mean better, and it gnaws at me, and it's hard to spend a week in a unit to devote so much, to sacrifice so much, and walk away thinking I could have done better, and being able to write those feelings out and discuss them and they are discussed it's not just writing them because as soon as I write them and other people see them then they want to ask and I'm forced to actually confront what I put on paper uh, has been remarkably helpful for me I think there's gonna be a lot of PTSD from everybody involved in the healthcare field who's been in, uh, in part of uh, patients care and uh, if you get a chance Please write it down, find someone, talk to someone. Even if you're not a writer, I am not a writer. I'm an anesthesiologist. I went into anesthesia because I get to scribble stuff and I never have to write anything. It was a wonderful career decision, um, but writing has been incredibly helpful for me and um, I encourage everybody to try it out. Um, and that's my uh, brief foray into the uh, COVID ICU in New York and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, I first wanna say thank you. Thank you for your service previously outside of the US, but I know that many of my colleagues, especially Ed Coombs, uh, and those that are in the New York area want to thank you so very much for your commitment, and your compassion, and your willingness. Um, I, you know, I can't express enough uh, to you, Dr. Daxton. Thank you. We yeah, thanks. We do have a few questions um, that I would like to uh, go through right now, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, yeah, it looks like, so, so curious. Um, did you have any um, patients that you did happen to use BiPAP on COVID, those COVID patients? Did you use any BiPAP modes? I never used BiPAP. Um, I use CPAP uh, for one patient. Um, uh, um, I want to get in the weeds of BiPAP for CPAP. I, I didn't want the pressure support for my guy. I thought he had good compliance. Uh, I just thought he was suffering from uh, malignant adelect trauma. I'll put it like that. So I thought CPAP was a better better route for him. 